Hey, what's up guys, T-Max here. Welcome back to the channel. About a year ago, a buddy of mine recommended a book called Chinese Lessons by John Pomfret. And I'm not really into politics, so I didn't really want to read the book. Uh, just looking at the cover, it seemed a bit uh, too controversial for me. So uh, about a year later, uh, he decided to move away from China and I was helping him move his stuff and he uh, you know, asked if I wanted the book and I was like, yeah, I'll take it. Uh, along with some other things that he generously donated. So a little bit about the author, John Pomfret, um, was an exchange student here in China in 1981. He studied at the University of Nanjing and then he became a journalist. So he was a journalist here in China for a few years and then moved away, moved all around the world and then came back to China in the early 2000s and he went out and found his former college classmates and interviewed them. And they just give a no holds barred, genuine account of their lives and of their opinions uh, on everything, things that you some people wouldn't normally share. And with their accounts and his personal experiences, he gives uh, just insight on how the government and how the country has changed uh, over the last 40 years. What I initially thought was going to be a newspaper article actually turned out to be a captivating story. Every time I picked the book up, I just, I wanted to keep reading. Every time I put it down, I was like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta finish that book. Uh, it's just really captivating. Just, he tells it in a way that really uh, draws you in and you just wanna learn more, you wanna know more. And as someone who lives in China, I was able to see some of the observations that he made and say, oh wow, 40 years later, some of that stuff is, I'm, I'm feeling the same way. I have these similar observations. And he gives explanations into why he thinks these things are. And I have my own personal uh, explanations and it's interesting to compare with him uh, via his book. And as someone who normally avoids uh, conversations about politics or uh, things that are sensitive like that, uh, this book just really was interesting and I really wanted to share uh, what I had learned in the book. And the way that he presented the information was just so intriguing, uh, especially uh, the information about Chairman Mao, uh, who most of us have heard of, but we don't really know much about unless you study the history. And then again, what do you learn in the history books versus what do you learn from someone's personal insight? Uh, so it was just very interesting to see what this American uh, felt and then also what his classmates, these Chinese people, felt about uh, the Cultural Revolution and, and just how their lives were, were changing here in China. So in addition to recommending this book to any expat who is living in China now or who plans to move to China or who's just interested in uh, world politics, I also noted down some observations that John had that uh, that resonated with me that either I've experienced myself or I thought were like, oh wow, I can't believe that. So I've compiled that list and I want to share that here with you now. First, if you're new to the channel, thank you for joining. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested more about culture shock or how I feel about living here in China, check out my video about culture shock, uh, which I call a fib nose. Uh, you'll find the link in the description below. There's two videos and they're just humorous uh, looks at culture shock, my experience with the culture shock here in China. Foreigners studying at the institute were not allowed to live with Chinese. So for me, the best way to meet them was to play pickup basketball. Introduced to China in 1896 by American missionaries. Despite its imperial pedigree, Mao loved basketball. It was the only Western sport not banned during the Cultural Revolution. I played pro basketball in Europe for a few years, so I still have my physique and people look at me and they're like, oh, he must play basketball. And the Chinese are no exception and they're it's very easy to start a conversation with someone they're like, oh, Kobe, LeBron, Michael Jordan, you know, what do you think? Do you play basketball? And um, I've even played pickup here, so I know that just people, they, they see you and they're like, oh, wow, hey, I want to be your friend, you know, uh, you like basketball too. And it's not just men, there are ladies at the pickup games as well. Um, so the Chinese really seem to like basketball, especially now that uh, they have had Chinese players in the NBA, so this, they've had some sort of um, patriotism, I guess. But the Chinese people love basketball, and it was very interesting to see that this is not a new observation. 40 years ago, they were, this was what expats were using to make friends, and we're doing the same today. As I learned first in public baths and later with roommates, Chinese would employ the skills of a contortionist to avoid exposing their private parts. 
One American woman spent a year rooming with a Chinese woman and never saw her legs above her knee. I've, so I've seen this uh, as well in locker rooms and gyms or even in the bathrooms. Uh, Chinese men are very um, shy, I guess. So they're you know they're very quick to hide their their body parts and. Not that it's you should be sharing your body parts, but after living in Europe for so long, where people, no matter if it's private or public, just really uh, free with their bodies, uh, so to go from that extreme to coming to China, where people are just like, "Ugh, you can't look at my body. Uh, I gotta hide." Chinese is a strange language for an American. While it has English's subject-verb-object sentence structure, the use of tones to impart diverse meanings makes it completely different. Mandarin Chinese has four tones, but thousands of words have the same pronunciation and the same tone, and are differentiated only by their written characters, of which Chinese employs somewhere north of 10,000. The sound li, for example, can mean 172 different things, among them present, power, pair, and profit. To clarify a word's meaning, speakers would often scribble out the character in question on their palms using their index fingers, often with a balletic flourish, as an imaginary inkbrush. I thought this was marvelously inefficient. As someone who is learning the language, uh, who came to China to learn the language, uh, I do complain sometimes about you know the the way Chinese is structured, especially with the lack of letters. And yeah, every time you know I say something wrong, they're like, "Oh no, it's this character," and I'm like, "I don't know what you're drawing." And so I it just when he said it was marvelously inefficient, that just struck home for me. I was like, "Yeah, I, I totally agree." Um, and as somebody whose Chinese is not super strong, I, I probably still will complain about that. But once my Chinese becomes much better, I'm sure I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, totally, guys. Yeah, just it's this character. So I'm looking forward to being at that level of Chinese. The American imperialists will have fried artichokes and pasta with pecorino. I'll have bacon and tomato pasta, Song joked. Looking at me, he smiled. I am still Chinese, you know. We don't like cheese. I mentioned in another video, where I'll leave a description somewhere, uh, my cheese bill <laughs> has like tripled living here in China, um, trying to, you have to buy the exported cheese because they don't make cheese here. It's not real cheese at least. So uh, living in Europe, you know, cheese is a staple food. And then coming to China, it's, it's an afterthought and, and probably can only find it in the big cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong. I haven't even tried to look for it when I'm traveling to smaller places. Um, so cheese is just so expensive and, and so they don't eat it as much. And a lot of my friends who have traveled, who eat cheese, they like it. But I think just uh, for whatever reason, culturally, they don't have the cheese here. And it's interesting to hear a Chinese person say, yeah, we, we don't like cheese. Chinese guys looked at women like Antonella in abject terror. Few male undergraduates were ever alone with female students and hadn't a clue how to put the moves on one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so when I see Chinese guys uh, trying to approach women or talking to them, it is it is quite interesting. It's um, they don't seem to have this this confidence that that at least like Chinese movies kind of like the man's dominant. Like, hey, you're my wife. Or, you know, maybe after they're married, they they gain this confidence, but. Single men trying to talk to single women, at least here in Beijing, is, is quite fun. I mean, I had my popcorn just watching, like, this dude is just so shy and clumsy and just does it. And, you know, I don't know if the girls think it's endearing and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, he's cute, so I'll, I'll date him. But uh, it's just really, it's funny to see 40 years later, they still just have this, <laughs> this issue. <laughs> I looked down and saw a piece of paper poking out from under her flesh-colored underwear, more girdle than briefs. So again, after living in Europe for so long where people are very uh, comfortable with their bodies and fashion is super important uh, in Europe, uh, you see lots of thongs or unseeable panty lines or, you know, and as a guy, of course, I'm looking at women, so you, you notice these things. Um, in China, it's, it's granny panties everywhere. Like, you just, even like if girls have like sexy skirts or clothes on and you just see these panty lines, it's like, hmm, that's... It just doesn't go with the outfit after having lived in Europe and seeing, you know, if a girl has a sexy dress on, you're not going to see panty lines or you're going to see a thong line as, as part of their their outfit. And I've not noticed that here at all. It's, it's, it's Granny Panty Central here. She had shed her rural habits, including hawking thunderously and spitting on the floor, and realized that she was not any lower, as she put it, than urban folk. So this is a woman who used to and spit on the ground 
which I do see um, a bit here in Beijing, but normally it's the men. But it's just amazing that this this habit of just and, and if it's one thing like to do it in the grass or a bit where nobody's gonna walk. I mean, they'll do it right on the pavement, on the steps, like in the stairwell when you're at work or at home. You just see spit everywhere on the ground and commonly walk areas, and I just like I feel like that's disrespectful to everybody around you. But so is smoking. I, we won't get into that. Despite the stereotype of the collectivist Oriental, for example, Mary discovered that Chinese were often more individualistic than foreigners. This is one thing that really shocked me when I got to China. I, from what I learned of communism, it's you know one for all, for one type thing. And uh, the Chinese people seem very uh, familial, so it's all about supporting each other. And of course, you know, when you watch movies, it's you know this village they always band together to fight you know the evil or whatever. So I kind of had this idea that people were going to be communal and always you know putting themselves second for the better good of the community. And after moving here and experience, it just doesn't. I don't want to say it's selfish, but I just feel like everybody blissfully unaware of other people's needs or wants or desires. It's like, you know, especially people walking with their phones, like, screw everybody around me. I don't care if the light's changing. I'm just going to walk in the middle of the street. Or, you know, if you're trying to walk into a building, they're like, oh, I need to stop right here in the doorway for whatever reason. And I'm not going to think to move to the side or I need to tie my shoes and do it right in the middle of the walkway. Um, things like that to me are quite, I feel, selfish or individualistic. Walking into stores, in the West, it's like, oh, let me hold the door open for you. Not here. It's like, all right, yeah, you, 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 you have arms. You can hold the door. And if you hold the door open for somebody else, they're like, what are you trying to set me up? What's going on here? So um, it's not right or wrong. It's just the culture, surprisingly, was is, uh, in my opinion, more individualistic than I was expecting. In a country where, by the age of 20, most women were engaged, if not married, the stress of finding a mate was intense especially for women over 25, like little Guan. Yeah, so I've made friends here, men and women, and my female friends who are around my age, 30 plus, um, you know, they even, there's a, they call themselves dogs, and it's just like, oh, how are you not married? How are you single at such an old age? And it's just very interesting, and, and most of it's not self-pressures. They don't want it, they haven't found somebody they want to marry, but it's the families, the, the parents, like, why aren't you married yet? What's wrong with you? You know, you need to get married and have kids and, and you know, live the normal life or whatever. Uh, and you even see it if you walk in the parks. You know, grandmothers will have pictures and information about their daughters and granddaughters. They're trying to marry them off. Um, which is just really interesting in a country, in a society that is not religious by nature, uh, that marriage is so important. Because in the West, marriage is a religious institution. So in China, it's not. It's just it's cultural and it's... It's deep and it's strong, and it's uh, you know you feel bad for a lot of the girls. You know, as men, we we kind of our clocks go longer, but women, you know, they have this short window, and it's like pressure, pressure, pressure. And it's like, geez, like give them a break. Chinese by this time had shed any communist pretensions to liking their darker brothers, and had returned to imperial China's racial stereotyping that linked dark skin with poverty and backwardness. So, as a dark-skinned person living in China. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting the surprise look, like, oh, what are you doing? Um, so I, I don't think too much about that. But amongst the Chinese people, uh, it's very interesting to see how desirable white skin is. All the beauty products. It's not like, hey, make your face smoother. It's make your face whiter. Oh, you know, protect your skin from the sun. No, it's keep your skin white by not letting the sun hit it. So the, the goal is this white skin. And of course, this dates back to the imperialistic time where, you know, the royalty didn't work in the field, so their skin was just lighter. And if you worked in the field, you're gonna have darker skin. Uh, so culturally, that's still relevant uh, as far as beauty is concerned. So it's really interesting. I, and I've talked about this in other videos, and I have some more videos planned about this. You know, when it's sunny, I mean, people go outside like in long sleeves and masks and hats and umbrellas, and it's like, it's, it's just a beautiful day. Like I'm in a tank top and swim trunks and flip flops, and they're you know head to toe covered because they want to protect their skin, uh, not from skin cancer. It's they don't want it to get dark. So it's quite interesting. He was in his late 30s, tall and slender, with a strong jaw, and unusual in a country where people had bowed for centuries a firm handshake.
Oh my goodness, I can't tell you what the the first time I shook a dude's hand and like, you know, he limp fishes you, you're like, hey, like, this is a two-way thing. You need to grab my hand. Come on. And it's, it's so common. Like, you just shake a lot of guys' hands and it's just really, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and bowing is not common at all in China. In Japan, I would, it makes sense, but in China, they don't bow. So, like, why is your handshake so soft? And it's, it's it's quite confusing, but then you'll meet like some girls, especially people. I try to meet people who are uh, outgoing and like ambitious, and those people, business people, they're gonna have strong handshakes and always catches you off guard because you shake six hands and you know they're all like, uh, uh, and then you, you know you get to the woman, and she like rips your wrist out of the socket, like whoa, okay, I'm talking to you, you need new business, or you know, or the guy that has the strong handshake, you're like, okay, you're you're gonna be the guy that I talk to because the the limp wrist guys, I can't do it. I love the practicality of the Chinese for bringing their rattan cots onto the street in the summer to sleep and their weirdness for walking backward in the park for exercise. In the winter, I guzzled bitter herbal concoctions that promised to beat chest colds and I avoided ice water for fear it could damage my intestines. Okay, so this is a two for one. Yeah, so I, I do workouts in the park um, in China for the last two and a half years. I have a free workout. Um, people just come, join, and it's all body weight. Um, I'm a personal trainer, so uh, I know how to adapt the movements to fit people's needs. And so in the park, I see all the different other styles of exercise. And one of them is, you know, it's usually older people, but they're walking backwards. And I'm like, where, where are you going? Like, what, is, what is this about? And I have my Chinese isn't so strong yet to just approach somebody and ask. But one day I'm just going to walk up to them and be like, what, 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 why are we doing this? Um, and of course, movement is good, especially when you're getting older. So. I'm just gonna chalk it up to the head, they need to move, but maybe there's another reason. And then the whole drinking hot water. I mean, so I did a video uh, a few weeks ago about Ai, always recommending drink hot water. You know, oh, I'm sick, I have a headache, you know, women problems, whatever. It's always drink hot water. This is the remedy for everything. Um, but there's another step, especially for women, is they avoid ice water, uh, cold water. So if a woman is having her time of the month, like she can't have ice cream, she can't drink cold water. It's, so in the culture, ice water is a no-no. And so it's very interesting to see that this that has persisted for so long. Uh, yeah, drink hot water. In Dongguan alone, a prefecture of 1.3 million people, tiny by Chinese standards, each of its 33 villages had businesses established in Hong Kong. Yeah, I love when, you know, you're talking to a Chinese person like, oh, where are you from? You know, I'm from this hometown. You know, it's, it's a small place, you've probably never heard of it. It's only 50,000 people. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I come from a small, small hometown too. You know, it's only 3 million people. And I'm like, only 3 million? There's some states in the U.S. that are that big. You know, countries in Europe, that's half their population. In China, that's a village. So it's so funny. <laughs> The Chinese are great people watchers. Kan now, or watching a commotion, is a favorite pastime. Yeah, so moving to Europe for the first time, uh, moving to Germany first, the Germans will stare at you. Not, you know, saying anything, you know, in America, if you stare at somebody and you make eye contact, they're like, oh, hey, I was looking at you, just, uh, I had to say something, I have to greet you. But in Germany, like, you know, you make eye contact, and they're like, I'm just looking at you, and you're like, hi, and they're like, I don't know you, I'm not waving back. So. Uh, in China, it's it's not the same as in Germany in the sense that they won't say hi back, but they will stare at you. Um, but the Chinese seem to be more friendly. They're just watching to see what you're doing. And, and like at least in Germany, like they'll watch you at a distance. So then it's like, okay, you're kind of far, so I guess you, you're just curious. But in China, they'll walk right up to you <laughs> and just like watch you. And it's like, hi. And of course, so the Chinese people, in my experience, are super friendly. And so if you, if you say something to them, they're like, oh, hey, yeah. And then they'll try to talk to you. Um, and if they don't speak English, they'll still just like be happy that you spoke to them. But they, they will stare. And then it's interesting when you see um, people who are arguing or if there's a commotion, people stop. I mean, you know, like in, in the West, when you're driving, there's an accident called rubbernecking. I mean, here it's like... Whatever is harder than rubber, cement necking, because they are not moving. They're just, I'm just gonna stop walking, I'm gonna stop driving so I can look and see what's happening. It's like, again, this is the individualistic thing, like, uh, can you move to the side and do that? 
Um, yeah, so they, they do like people watching. The reality was that China was morphing into a society with voluminous rules and regulations that few bother to obey or enforce. This is the thing that, that gets me. It's like, again, I felt coming to China, you hear about you know how strict the government is and in certain areas they are super strict. And in other areas it's like, yeah, we don't follow that rule. It's, it's so weird because they know which ones you know, are enforced and which ones are not. Um, but for me, I, you know, I, I'm just going to follow all the rules because I don't know which ones I can get away with until I've lived here long enough and I can start, you know, doing as the Romans do. But uh, some of the rules that just really irritate me, like no smoking and, and they'll smoke in front of a sign that says no smoking with the 2,000 yuan penalty in front of it. And they're just like, like blowing smoke on the sign. And, it, and it's probably a cop doing it. <laughs> So it's like, oh, so why is that rule even there? Just just don't make it a rule. And then later you see something like something small and you're like, oh, you know, that's a suggestion. And they're like, oh, we're gonna take you to jail. Like don't walk on the grass. And like five people pop out of nowhere if you walk on the grass and they tackle you and take you to prison for eight years. It's like, wow, the grass is more important than public health. So uh, I'm still learning which rules to follow and which ones not to, um, but I'll, I'll try my best to follow all of them. Old Shu screeched as he veered down the street in his Jetta, driving perilously like Mr. Magoo. Okay, so drivers in Beijing, like, the, it could be green for a pedestrian to walk across, but you still need to look both ways because they, the drivers don't care. They don't stop. They will run you over. And it's not like, you know, they're like aiming for you. It's just like, they don't care. Or, or they can't see like Mr. Magoo. They're like, oh, I'm gonna go because I'm in a car. And so, but having traveled to other cities like Xi'an or Shanghai or Harbin, people stop. So I don't know what it is about Beijing. The drivers just don't care. And yeah, it's, it's dangerous out there. Once during a meal in Nanjing, as he recounted a dalliance he had had with a nurse, he looked at me through a haze of cigarette smoke and said, no other Chinese man will ever tell you about his sex life. So in addition to Chinese guys being super shy about approaching girls and talking to them, None of my Chinese friends have ever brought this subject up of, of sex. Uh, you know, it's just guys and, you know, guys talk. None of my Chinese friends have ever done this. I mean, after living in Europe, I mean, you just, you don't even know the guy. He just walks up to you and just starts sharing information. It's like, we, we're, I, we're not friends. Like, why are you telling me such intimate details? And in China, like, you could be blood brothers and they're like, I'm still not telling you anything. No deed to nothing. It's private. So, in many cities, the average marrying age had jumped from 24 for men and 23 for women to around 30. So again, with that pressure for women to get married, um, every, men and women are both just waiting longer to get married. Uh, so it seems like they're having to deal with this pressure longer, uh, or maybe they just don't care as much. I don't know, but a lot of my friends that are around my age are unmarried, so they might be dating, uh, deciding whether or not to get married, and some of them are just single and like, oh. You know, I'll get married when I get married. So it's uh, it's interesting to see this dynamic of some of them just not really caring, and then some of them like, you know, mom's been beating me down every day. I gotta find a man. It's like, oh wow, that's not a good reason to find somebody. But I think that's kind of shifting and changing now with the the newer generation. Uh, maybe the parents are also easing up and not um, pressuring their children so much anymore. In spite of the fact that Chinese are generally dutiful students. China's roadways are the most dangerous in the world. In the 23 years since Old Wu's graduation, the number of traffic deaths had grown faster than China's thundering GDP to 300 a day, more than double the rate of the United States, even though China has about one-tenth the number of cars. For people between 15 and 45, motor fatalities are the leading cause of death. The World Health Organization predicts that by 2020, traffic deaths in China will hit a million per year. Coach Wong wasn't wearing a seatbelt, neither was Old Wu. Old Wu would glide through intersections while I prayed in the back seat. Okay, so this brings us back to these drivers in Beijing. From what I hear, the test is actually quite difficult and there's lots of steps, but maybe they don't teach anything about instinct because the drivers in Beijing are awful. And it's just like, they'll just be driving down a one way and it's like they can't read the signs or something. or. Maybe this goes back to the individualistic thing. They don't care and they're like, I need to go here, so I'm just gonna drive down this street. Um, cars are driving in the bike lane. 
I mean, it's, yeah. And so, and this doesn't include the scooters, who are the worst drivers in the world, because they don't have licenses. So, you know, you kind of expect, okay, they don't have licenses, they should be terrible. But to drive a car, the ability to drive in Beijing specifically is heavily regulated. So you would think, like, they would be good drivers, and it's, they're not. It's, it's just really bad driving. So, thankfully, the fatalities have come down, but it's, it's almost a surprise. Or, I couldn't imagine what it was like 40 years ago, because if it's like this now, and it was worse before. <laughs> Woo! As we down bowls of steaming beef noodles, I did what I normally do, slurp. May, perhaps because of her years in the United States, did not. I was the country bumpkin Chinese, and she was the polished Harvard girl. So yeah, Chinese people make so much noise when they eat. It's, it's interesting. Like slurping, I know in Japan it's like a sign of respect. In China it's not, again it's just, I think the difference in manners and culture, like making noise while eating is not a problem. People chewing their mouth up and like talking with their mouth full, like th these are not uh, taboo, they're not problems here. Uh, another thing is like burping or even farting at the dinner table, no problem. Picking your teeth with a toothpick, blasphemy, you cannot you see people that cover their mouth, they do this. I don't know why this is worse than any of those other things. Talk with your mouth open, no problem, but picking your teeth for some reason. <laughs> Very interesting. So, culture. Across the country, Chinese were downloading proxy servers that allowed them access to news sites such as those of CNN and New York Times, which the Chinese government blocked. So that was back in like two th early 2000, 2003. We still don't have access to any of those sites and we still have to use a VPN. So pretty much almost the entire existence of the modern internet has been blocked in China. So thank goodness for VPNs. Speaking with doctors, government officials, and journalists, I learned that by December 2002, the Communist Party in Guangdong knew it had a serious health problem. Nonetheless, it kept quiet because it did not want to scare off the millions of tourists who descended on southern China every Chinese New Year which in 2003 fell on February 1st. Whoa, deja vu, COVID. I mean, yeah, just some things don't change. So what do you think of these observations? Uh, do you agree with them, disagree with them? If you live in China, have you had similar experiences, different experiences? Do you have different explanations as to why some of these things are? Um, again, when you see something and it strikes you as different, you would probably point it out. And if you don't think it's different or it seems normal to you, you probably don't even notice it. So now, go back into your daily life in China, see if you notice these things. Uh, so leave comments below, let me know what you think. Like, share, subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.